tonight, we get to the core of the Apple Watch. Hillary Clinton defends herself, sort of, and Facebook has lost that loving, fat feeling. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 291 for Tuesday, March 10th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you can monitor your income, spending, and the performance of your investments on a single, easy-to-read screen. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Welcome back to Tech News Tonight. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get started. Yesterday, Apple announced more details about their new watch due out at the end of next month. Here to talk to us about whether any of us really need the Apple Watch is senior editor at Business Insider, Steve Kovac. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thanks for having me again. So you argued that at the event yesterday, Apple failed to give us a reason to buy the Apple Watch. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, the biggest question going in was, you know, why are they making this thing? Um, you know, that we've seen over the last year and a half, you know, everyone, Samsung, Motorola, Google, get involved in trying to make a smartwatch happen. And no one really gave us a reason like, okay, what what problem is this solving? You know, um, if you want to look back, we know what the iPad solved. It, it killed off the crappy netbook category that everyone thought was going to explode. And it's like, oh, no, actually, we're okay with tablets. Um, the iPhone turned terrible smartphones into an amazing device and created a, a brand new computing platform. Um, and, and they told us that, you know, they told us this is what, what these products are for. We haven't been told that about the Apple watch, you know, is it jewelry? Is it just a accessory for your phone? Is it a way to communicate easier? Is it all, everyone seems to have a theory and, um, and it, you, I expected something from Apple and they didn't tell us, uh, it's, it seems to be, uh, up to the user, I guess, of what you make of it. Well, I mean, you argue that a lot of these apps that we love on the iPhone, Instagram and things like that, they didn't exist before, but, uh, you know, they didn't exist because the iPhone didn't exist. I mean, isn't there, so is there anything that you could guess that might, they might be creating so that you would make this useful? Yeah, I think that's the opportunity here. And I mean, it's kind of odd, like you, you want to look at how much our lives have changed in the last seven ish years since the app store launched, uh, Uber would not be a company or, you know, a 40 some odd billion dollar company without the iPhone. Um, and Snapchat wouldn't be a $19 billion company without the iPhone. Um, and that's because it, it created this new computing platform uh, to develop for. Um, you know, I'm still not sure if this can become that kind of platform, if it's just a, a shrunken down smartphone on your wrist, or if there are uh, clever new ways to communicate. Apple kind of gave us some hints. Uh, you know, there's a thing where you can like doodle on your watch and send it to another watch user or the share the heartbeat or those cute little emoji. Uh, maybe uh, developers will come out with something really clever and popular uh, like that. Um, but that's going to be a couple of years before we start seeing that kind of thing. So in the meantime, we're all going to be arguing, do we need an Apple Watch? Uh, or is it going to be a success or something? So it's going to be it's not going to end anytime soon, I think. Yeah, well, I liked the Dart email app. I don't know if you've used that, but it's the one that just, oh. you know, you can ask a question and then give the answers, like, where do you want to go to dinner? You know, this restaurant or this restaurant? Did you see that? No, oh, I haven't seen that. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, though. and then, I mean, so I think it will be interesting because, I mean, email is such, uh, it's such a pain and it's, you know, so exhausting to slog through your email. So if there's an app that can make it all more simple and just, you know, uh, I'm going to ask you a question and give you the answers and you just press a button on your watch and tell me. I think that could be interesting. Yeah, I mean, the biggest hint they gave us was like, okay, it's going to save you time. You're not going to have to pull out your phone all the time. But at the same time, I'm not sure I want to spend uh, between $350 and $17,000 for a gadget uh, on top of my you know, $800 smartphone that helps me do that. Um, I'm not sure if it's totally worth the cost. I mean, there is a fashion aspect to it that I think people will be into, but um, I'm not entirely sold yet. So do you use any of the health apps? Like, are you a runner? Or do you use any of those? Yeah, I use, um, I was a, a Fitbit user for a while and then I kind of, I don't know, I just got kind of bored updating it and like meticulously logging in all my stuff. I mean, it tracks steps automatically, but you know, if I'm going to lift at the gym or get on the bike or something, I have to like manually input that. I got kind of bored of it to be honest. So, 
Um, I don't know. I don't know if the watch is going to change my mind about that or not. Well, I, I mean, I'm sort of obsessive about all the health kit apps and I like to see how much I walk around and how long my runs are. And so it would be nice. I don't, I mean, right now I carry my iPhone with me. It would be nice to have it for me. Yeah. Um, so what do you make of the argument that at the Apple Watch is just a sales vehicle to sell more iPhones? Do you think that has any accuracy? No, I don't. I saw John Pachowski of BuzzFeed formerly Recode write that. And I don't see that. The iPhone is just a mega smash success. They're going to sell themselves. And this thing needs an iPhone to work. I don't think people are going to go into the Apple store and say, oh, I, I haven't wanted an iPhone, but they have a watch now. So now I'm going to buy it. No, I don't think that that's subtly going to change people's minds because they're going to have a piece of jewelry to go with it. Um, the iPhone sells itself. I think what's a bigger uh, value to the iPhone ecosystem is that research kit um, that they announced yesterday. And uh, there's so much potential there. I mean, there's so, there's so much technology built into this thing, um, with sensors and so forth, that um, they can really build this whole new uh, use case for it. I think that was super, that arguably the most interesting thing they announced yesterday. Um, and, you know, just to tell a personal story, my mom... Um, she has a heart condition and she had to have a heart monitor for a while and it's plugged into like this really crappy Samsung Android phone and it didn't work all the time and it was tough to use. And I was thinking, man, if someone would just invent something like that for the iPhone where they can plug in a heart monitor, beam the data to the doctor, um, it, that would be so great. And Apple is clearly working on that already and with some major names. Uh, that's really exciting. It is. I mean, it is interesting that all that data, I mean, we tend to talk about how it's so scary they have all this data, but it really it could be used, put to really good use, I think. Also. Yeah, especially if it's if it's safe and encrypted. Um, you know, after the iCloud hacks last summer, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm ready to trust that, but it, it's definitely a cool step. It is. So let's talk about China. Now, Reuters reported today that the luxury edition of the Apple Watch is going to cost 23000 U.S. dollars in China. That's even more than it'll cost in the U.S. What are your thoughts? Do you think that chi the Chinese will be sold on the Apple Watch? Do you think that's oh, important? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's such a wildly different culture over there. And there are a lot of new rich people who are looking for ways to flaunt their wealth. And this is the perfect way uh, for them to do that. Uh, there, there are people who, you know, it's such an interesting transitioning com country right now. And um, I think Russia, too, is the same thing, just like, you know, the 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 new, new rich, you know, they're they're ready to flaunt. And uh, this is the perfect way you tie it to a brand like Apple. Um, it's something you're going to throw away in two years, but it's just another way to say I have so much money. It doesn't even matter. Um, and so twenty thousand dollars, fifty thousand uh, dollars. There's n wealthy people are going to buy it anyway. Yeah, I think I agree. But you say that the real future of Apple lies not in the watch, but in the new MacBook that was announced yesterday. Um, I guess it's almost as thin as an iPhone, but it's powerful enough to run the full desktop operating system. I mean, it comes in gold. It has this fancy new single port, but you have some concerns about it. What are they? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is uh, a testament that Apple is still innovating and in the thing that made it a company in the first place, which is the Mac. And, uh, you know, everyone talks about the death of the PC, but Apple keeps bucking that trend. And uh, the, Macs are, the Mac business is growing while the rest of the PC industry is flat to down, which is super interesting. And it's because of stuff like this. They're, they're creating the future right now in the sense that, okay, fine, this thing is going to have one port. You're, you're not going to be able to plug a lot of stuff into it. But, you know, people said the same thing about the original MacBook Air when it first came out in 2008, it was a terrible computer. No one should have bought it. It looked nice. It was thin and light and stuff, um, but it, it it was too limited. But then within two years, boom, the MacBook Air is the best laptop you can buy. And I totally see that happening with this new MacBook. Um, as the world evolves kind of around it and we start, uh, we don't need to use USB sticks and we don't need to plug our iPhone into um, our computers anymore and uh, DSLR cameras have a way to wirelessly beam your big photos over and so on. Um, th this will eventually uh, evolve into the MacBook Air killer and I can totally see them killing off the MacBook Air line in favor of something like this. Right. So now is, is, there, is there a power question with this? I mean, I have a MacBook Pro. I love it, but I, I often look at it and think, well, this is way more power than I need. I could do, I mean, we use Google Sheets and, you know, Gmail, and mostly I think right. maybe I could just use a Chromebook. Are we getting to the point where we don't need as much processing power as we did before? For most people, yeah. I mean, if you're a photo or a video editor, obviously you're going to need a pro, a pro level machine. But I mean, there's a reason why Chromebooks have become so popular. And that's because most people realize, hey, 
I have a phone that I'm carrying around with me everywhere. That does a lot of stuff. And then when I'm home, all I really want to do is what email, check Facebook. I mean, you know, I'm a writer for me. I use my MacBook just to write pretty much. Um, and you don't need a ton of horsepower to do that. And if you have a super thin light portable device, um, that's fine. The only problem is this thing is super expensive. I mean, it's just as expensive as the cheapest, uh, retina MacBook pro. Um, so, and you're, you're sacrificing a lot of power just for a pretty thing. So who's going to buy this? Do you think? I think the people who want something really pretty and, and a status symbol at first, but, um, it's going to, in a couple of years, it's going to be the new MacBook Air and it's going to be just as ubiquitous as that. And we're all going to be using them or something similar. Well, thank you, Steve. What's your next big story you're working on? Can you tell us about it? Oh, uh, my next big story. What's coming up? Well, probably more watch stuff, I think, but I can't, there's some other secret stuff I can't really tell you. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll look forward to it. Steve Kovac is the senior editor at Business Insider. Thank you so much for coming on. Steve. All right. Thanks for having me again. Coming up, Hillary Clinton talks dresses and devices, and the CIA wants to know your score on trivia crack. But first, it's a huge pain to keep track of investments on a bunch of different websites. If you use personal capital, you can access everything in one place. And if you're not at your computer, you can get the app for your phone or your tablet, so you're never far from checking on your Apple Watch Luxury Edition fund. Personal Capital's financial software lets you aggregate all your accounts into one interface and drill down to the details. You can actually analyze your cash flow down to every penny. Take the headache out of household budgeting and make sure your bills are in track with what you have to spend. You can also forecast the value of your retirement portfolio and see if you're saving and investing enough to last for your ideal re retirement plan. Now, I sort of stopped paying attention to what my investments are doing, but Personal Capital made it easy for me to detect 401k and mutual fund fees that might have delayed my retirement. But don't take my word for it. It's your money. Signing up only takes a minute, and you'll see the benefits immediately. I know because I did it. I'm not just reading these words that someone wrote for me. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to help make better investment decisions right away. To set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash tn 2 Personal Capital is free, and it's the smart way to grow your money. We thank Personal Capital for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Hillary Clinton addressed reporters regarding the growing controversy about her use of her personal email account for government correspondence during her time as Secretary of State. Let's take a look at some of what she said. There are four things I want the public to know. First, when I got to work as Secretary of State, I opted for convenience to use my personal email account, which was allowed by the State Department, because I thought it would be easier to carry just one device for my work and for my personal emails instead of two. Looking back, it would have been better if I would simply used a second email account and carried a second phone, but at the time, this didn't seem like an issue. Second. The vast majority of my work emails went to government employees at their government addresses, which meant they were captured and preserved immediately on the system at the State Department. Third, after I left office, the State Department asked former secretaries of state for our assistance in providing copies of work-related emails from our personal accounts. I responded right away and provided all my emails that could possibly be work-related, which totaled roughly 55,000 printed pages, even though I knew that the State Department already had the vast majority of them. We went through a thorough process to identify all of my work-related emails and deliver them to the State Department. At the end, I chose not to keep my private personal emails, emails about planning Chelsea's wedding or my mother's funeral arrangements, condolence notes to friends, as well as yoga routines, family vacations, the other things you typically find in inboxes. No one wants their personal emails made public, and I think most people understand that and respect that privacy. Fourth, I took the unprecedented step of asking that the State Department make all my work-related emails public for everyone to see. I am very proud 
of the work that I and my colleagues and our public servants at the department did during my four years as Secretary of State. And I look forward to people being able to see that for themselves. Again, looking back, it would have been better for me to use two separate phones and two email accounts. I thought using one device would be simpler and obviously it hasn't worked out that way. <laughs> well, you can now see I'm the rest of what she's talking about and including how she was sort of grilled by uh, the press and answered the questions. Well, I think it was nice that she broke her silence on the issue and admitted that it would have been better if she'd used her government account. Reporters there were generally unimpressed with her varied excuses, including the fact that it's difficult to carry two phones when wearing a dress with no pockets. I'm not sure I really understand that one. Uh, Cybersecurity experts expressed uh, concern about the security of Clinton's network. Clinton defended the server's safety, saying it had numerous safeguards. Uh, She has yet to reveal the exact level of encryption that was used by the Clinton server. The news about Clinton's private emails all but overshadowed an even bigger cybersecurity story today that Twit News Director Mike Elgin reported this morning on Tech News Today. According to a report from The Intercept, the Central Intelligence Agency has been working with security researchers on a multi-year sustained effort to crack the security keys used to encrypt data on Apple iPhones and iPads. The report is based on top secret documents obtained by The Intercept. Now this afternoon, there was an update to this story. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that the CIA is also using aircraft to locate specific cell phones. According to journal sources, devices on aircrafts, often called dirt boxes, mimic cell phone towers and can also be used to intercept signals and conversations coming from phones. I'm sure Mike will be following this story tomorrow as it develops. This morning, Mike also reported that last that late yesterday, one of the biggest and best online tech publications, GigaOM, has been shut down. GigaOM was started by tech writer Om Malik in 2006. It has gone dark reportedly because the site, no longer under Malik's direction, was unable to pay creditors. Now, tech writer Owen Williams from the Next Web, who we will have on tomorrow, offered this excellent tweet about the loss of one of the great tech journalism sites. He said, if you want to support the media, there's things that you can do. Disable ad block software, buy a subscription, and share the stuff you enjoy. We appreciate it. It's Patch Tuesday. That means we eat cupcakes, one for every new security bulletin. This month, Microsoft or added 14 new security bulletins for Windows software, and they added two new families to the malicious software removal tool specifically designed to clean up the Lenovo Superfish malware that we reported last month. And finally, if you think change.org petitions about emojis are silly and useless, then you can stop watching right now. I'll wait. Good. I'm glad you're still here. Today, Facebook officially changed the label on an emoji that previously had a stuffed cheeks and a double chin. The emoji was called feeling fat, but it is now called feeling stuffed. The new designation was inspired by a change.org petition that received over 16,000 signatures. The campaign was led by a body issues group who argued that fat is not a feeling. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com. 